Two weeks ago, President Dean L. Larson and I returned from South America where we visited with members and missionaries in Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia. I'm happy to report that the work continues to go forward in spite of the current violence that is present there. Many of you served your missions in those countries, and I know you have concern about what is happening in South America. For many years, we've enjoyed relative peace while doing missionary work in the world. However, in some places today, we find it necessary to teach members and missionaries how to protect themselves in a world of increasing violence. The Prophet Joseph Smith saw the challenges of doing missionary work in this dispensation. May I share with you this morning the remarkable growth of the Church as prophesied by the Prophet Joseph Smith. 183 years have now passed since the Prophet's birth. We must never forget his perseverance in the face of incredible hardships and opposition to bring forth the priesthood, new scriptures, complete doctrines, full ordinances and covenants to exalt men and women through membership in the restored Church of Jesus Christ. In the earliest years of the development of the Church, at a time when its enemies already were making great efforts to stop the work, the Prophet knew that no enemy, present or, or future, would have sufficient power to frustrate and stop the purposes of God. Even Joseph's closest associates in those early years did not understand that the Church would roll forth from small beginnings to fill the entire world, as prophesied by the Old Testament prophet Daniel. At age 27, Wilford Woodruff was present at a meeting called by the prophet Joseph in Kirkland, Ohio, early in 1834. At this time, the saints who had gathered in Missouri were suffering great persecutions. Mobs had driven them from their homes in ja Jackson County. Some of them had been tried, had tried to establish themselves in neighboring counties, but persecutions followed them. The prophet had announced the, the intention to go to Missouri and had enlisted a number of volunteers to go as Zion's camp to rescue the saints there. Wilford Woodruff gives a vivid description of the prophet's message to the elders who met in preparation for the Zion's Camp March. Quote, on Sunday night, the prophet called on all who held the priesthood to gather into a little log schoolhouse they had there. It was a small house, perhaps 14 feet square but it held the whole of the priesthood of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were then in the town of Kirkland, and who had gathered together to go off in Zion's camp. That was the first time I ever saw Oliver Cowdery or heard him speak, the first time I ever saw Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball and the two Pratts and Orson Hyde and many others. There were no apostles in the church except Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. When we got together, the prophet called upon the elders of Israel with him to bear testimony of this work. Those that I have named spoke, and a good many that I have not named bore their testimonies. When they got through, the prophet said, Brethren, I've been very much edified and instructed in your testimonies here tonight. But I want to say to you before the Lord that you know no more concerning the destinies of this church and the kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. I was rather surprised. And then the prophet said, It is only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight but this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world." Close quote. 
You'll detect in this statement by Joseph Smith no element of cautious forecasting. He certainly did not predict future growth based on past trends. He gave a bold statement, a prophecy, given by the Spirit of the Lord. You may remember that the Articles of Faith first appeared in a letter that Joseph Smith wrote to Mr. John Wentworth, the editor of the Chicago newspaper. In the Wentworth letter, which was dated 1 March 1842, Joseph Smith wrote a vision of the destiny of the church in profound prophecy. He wrote, The standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage, mobs may combine, armies may assemble, culminy may defame, but the truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear, till the purposes of God shall be accomplished, and the great Jehovah shall say, The work is done. Since the organization of the Church in 1830, nearly 16 decades have passed. We've had 158 years to observe what has happened in the fulfillment of this prophecy. Together, let us see how the truth of God has swept the nations despite persecutions and opposition. Let us see how the continents and countries have been penetrated and what peoples of the world have heard the gospel sound in their ears. Let us also receive, review selected examples of opposing efforts of the unhallowed hands of the enemy, how persecutions have raged, how mobs have combined, how armies have assembled, and how culminy has defamed. In case you're not familiar with the term culminy, it is a false charge or misrepresentation given maliciously to damage another person's reputation. Although the Church began its first decade with only six members, unhallowed hands made every effort to stop the spread of the gospel and destroy the Church in its infancy. Joseph Smith soon learned how mobs may combine. From Church history we read, certain residents of Hiram, Ohio, vented their personal feelings with mob action directed against the prophet and Sidney Rigdon. Stimulated by whiskey and hidden behind blackened faces, a gang of more than two dozen men dragged Joseph from his bed during the night of March 24, 1832. Choking him into submission, they stripped him naked, scratched his skin with their fingernails, tore his hair, and then smeared his body with tar and feathers. A vial of nitric acid forced against his teeth splashed on his face. A front tooth was broken. Meanwhile, other members of the mob dragged, dragged Rigdon by the heels from his home, bumping his head on froze, the frozen ground, which left him delirious for days. The prophet's friends spent the night removing the tar to help keep him keep a, an appointment that he had Sunday morning. He addressed a congregation that included Simmons Ryder, the organizer of the mob. Ryder was a convert who disaffected because the prophet Joseph misspelled his name. A year later, another mob destroyed the Evening and Morning Star printing office, interrupting the publication of the Book of Commandments a collection of divine revelations received through Joseph Smith also learned how culminy may defame. In 1834, Eber D. Howe published Mormonism Unveiled, the first anti-Mormon book. It included a variety of old and new charges against Joseph Smith's credibility and tried to undermine the veracity of the Book of Mormon. The saints in Missouri found out in a tragic manner how the armies of the enemy may assemble. In 1838, Governor Lyburn W. Boggs 
of Missouri issued the infamous order of extermination, and our history records the tragedy at Hans Mill. Despite intense opposition against all efforts to erect the standard of truth, 597 missionaries were set apart during the 1830s, and nearly 20,000 converts joined the restored church during the first decade. Missionaries taught and baptized people in most of the United States, then in the Union, and both Canada and Great Britain were open to the preaching of the gospel. The gospel message penetrated two continents and began to sweep across the nations. Heber C. Kimball was one of the great missionaries in the church in the early years. He was a friend of the prophet Joseph and a relative of Brigham Young. He was tall and he was bald, even when he was young. People liked to tease him about his baldness. And he one time gave the following explanation how he lost his hair. Shortly after joining the church, Heber was called as a very young man to serve a mission in Nova Scotia. He traveled the entire 1,500 miles from his home in New York on foot with a valise on his back. Heber said of this mission, quote, Soon after I started, I found that I was rather unlearned, though I knew that before, but I knew it better after I started. I began to study the scriptures, and I had so little knowledge that the exercise of study began to swell my head and open my pores, insomuch that the hairs dropped out. <laughs> and if you let your minds expand as mine did, you'll have no hair on your heads either. <laughs> Heber C. Kimball was a man of great faith and good humor. Hope, I hope those of you who are here this morning whose hair is thinning, that it is for the same reason. These early missionaries succeeded in the face of all opposition because they had an unwavering faith to open their mouths and declare the truth and because they took with them the mighty sword of the Lord's Spirit. They remembered the baptismal covenant to stand as witnesses of God at all times, in all things, and in all places, even until death. The same year that Lorenzo Snow set out on his first mission, the prophet Joseph Smith gave Heber C. Kimball a very significant missionary assignment. The prophet Joseph approached Heber while the latter was seated in the Kirkland Temple. Brother Heber, the prophet said, the Spirit of the Lord has whispered to me, let my servant Heber go to England and proclaim my gospel and open the door of salvation to that, to that nation. The First Presidency and the Twelve hold the keys for opening the nations to missionary work. When the pattern has been followed of calling an apostle to open a land to the preaching of the gospel, the Great success has resulted. Heber C. Kimball baptized more than 1,000 converts in the western part of England during his mission. He and his companions laid the foundation for future growth in that great nation. Of the early work, Joseph Smith said, quote, the work in which we are unitedly engaged is one of no ordinary kind. The enemies we have to contend are against our subtle and well-skilled in maneuvering. It behooves us to be on the alert, to concentrate our energies, and that the best feelings should exist in our midst. And then, by the help of all the Almighty, we shall go on from victory to victory and from conquest to conquest. Our evil passions will be subdued. Our prejudices depart. We shall find no room in our bosoms for hatred. Vice will hide its deformed head, and we shall stand approved in the sight of heaven and be acknowledged the sons of God." Close quote. During the 1840s, persecutions continued to rage, especially against the prophet Joseph Smith. In 1841, he was arrested in Illinois on a fugitive warrant issued by Governor Boggs of Missouri, but Judge Stephen A. Douglas of Quincy, Illinois, 
ruled the writ ineffective and released the prisoner. A year later, John C. Bennett, mayor of Nauvoo, plotted to assassinate the prophet. After the plot failed, Bennett resigned as mayor, was expelled from the church, and later wrote the scandalous account entitled The History of the Saints, or an expose of Joe Smith and the Mormons. The persecutions culminated on 27 June 1844. Joseph and Hiram were killed by a mob that rushed Carthage jail. In the midst of all these difficulties, 1,454 missionaries were set apart during the 1840s. Church membership grew to more than 48,000. Missionaries were made initial visits to Australia, India, Jamaica, South America, and Germany. Although the early work in those, these countries was limited and resulted in only a few scattered conversions, the servants of the Lord began learning valuable lessons about how to reach out to people of different cultures. In 1841, Orson Hyde visited and dedicated Israel for the gathering of the Jews. Despite the great difficulty of travel, the restored gospel penetrated three more continents. During the 1840s, Wilford Woodruff, who had been tutored by the prophet Joseph and later ordained an apostle, was sent to be a missionary in England. The success of his missionary work in southern England in 1840 may be unparalleled. Because of the great faith of Wilford Woodruff, Heber C. Kimball, and other missionaries and their ability to follow the promptings of the Spirit, the truth of God began to sweep a nation and sound in many years. Although much of the energy of the saints in the 1850s was devoted to the migration to Utah and the development of a new home, missionary work continued as did the persecutions. In May 1857, Elder Parley P. Pratt of the Council of the Twelve was assassinated while on a mission in Arkansas. In the same month, United States President Buchanan issued orders for an army to assemble at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to march to Utah on false assumptions that the people of Utah were in rebellion against the United States. This was the beginning of the so-called Utah War. Two months later, in July, Brigham Young received word that an American army under the command of General Albert Johnston was approaching Utah. Church leaders took the position that they had violated no laws and decided to allow no military invasion to drive them from their homes. In June 1858, after having been stopped for the winter by delaying tactics of the Mormons, General Johnston's army finally entered the Salt Lake Valley, but did so peacefully. In the 1850s, 705 missionaries were set apart. Missions of the church were opened in Scandinavia, France, Italy, Switzerland, and Hawaii. Initial missionary work began also in such parts of the world as India, Hong Kong, Thailand, Burma, South Africa, West Indies, and Italy. Many of these efforts were discontinued after a few years. However, the Scandinavian mission, organized in 1850, baptized about a thousand converts each year during the decade, mostly in Denmark. Missionaries in Britain baptized more than 15,000 converts who then left for Utah between 1849 and 1857. At the end of the decade, missionaries were teaching the gospel in 15 nations and two territories. Worldwide church membership numbered more than 57,000. Members of the church enjoyed little public favor in the early years of our history. However, attitudes improved somewhat during the 1860s, partly because the Civil War diverted attention elsewhere, partly because of Mormon cooperation in building the Transcontinental Railroad. But that didn't last. Polygamy debates led to the Edmunds Tucker Act, bringing the church in the 1880s to a low point 
in terms of public contempt. President John Taylor and the saints of his day certainly experienced how persecutions may rage. The Edmunds Tucker Act of 1887 seemed designed to destroy the church itself, eliminating, eliminating both polygamy and the influence of the church on Utah's political life. Among other stringent provisions, the law disincorporated the church, abolished female suffrage, and ordered the confiscation of practically all church property. Outside of Utah, unhallowed hands continued to oppose the work. In Georgia, Joseph Standing and his missionary companions were walking on a public road near the county line of Catoosa and Whitfield counties when they were compelled by a mob to go to an isolated spot in the woods. Elder Standing was shot by a mob member when he put up some resistance to move to another spot. Notwithstanding this and other acts of persecution, in the three decades from 1860 to 1890, 4,458 missionaries were set apart Worldwide mission membership grew from 57,000 to 183,000. Four stakes developed into 22 stakes. At the end of the 1880s, missionaries were serving in 20 nations and three territories. During this decade, doors were open and sustained missionary efforts began in the Netherlands, Iceland, Finland, Belgium, and Samoa. For varying periods from a few months to 25 years, missionaries labored also in Armenia, Syria, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Burma, and India. The 40-year period from 1890 to 1930 brought some improvement in public attitudes towards the church. The manifesto disclaiming Polygamy in the 18, 1890 helped reverse the trend. So did an active public relations campaign for statehood, ushering in a period of less bitter, but still generally hostile in attitudes, running from 1890 to the late 1920s. The church and its doctrine were still disliked during the period but news articles began to speak of the people themselves as basically good with high potential. This was the period during which B.H. Roberts and Reed Smoot were elected to Congress, but Reed Smoot had to fight to be seated. The national debate hurt the church image badly, but it gradually improved during a long career in which Reed Smoot became one of the country's leading senators. Opposing the church heated up, opposition to the church heated up in 1922, owing, owing to some, in some part, to the influence of a movie entitled Trapped by the Mormons. The uneventful days of tracting in the British mission were a thing of the past. On 10 January 1922, Ezra Taft Benson mentioned in his journal without elaboration, the movie's author, Winifred Graham, on our track again, he wrote. The next day, Elder Benson was evicted from one house, and a week later, still, he wrote, more stories of the terrible Mormons were being circulated. On Sunday, January 29th, someone attempted to break up one of their meetings. A week later, the president wrote, Tracting in South Street, women rather excited, afraid they're going to be taken to Utah. That was all he put in his journal. Persecution still raged, even in the 20th century. But the truth of God continued to go forth boldly, as Joseph Smith had prophesied. On 3 September 1925, President Heber J. Grant announced the First Presidency had decided to open missionary work in South America. Following the Lord's pattern for unlocking the doors of the kingdom and all nations, the First Presidency called Elder Melvin J. Ballard, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and my own grandfather, 
with Ruland S. Wells and Ray L. Pratt of the First Council of the Seventy to go to South America. They were called to dedicate the land for the preaching of the gospel, to open a mission there, and to lay the foundation for establishing the church in, the va in this vast continent. After a three-week journey by ship, covering more than 7,000 miles, the three missionaries arrived in Buenos Aires in December 1925. On Christmas morning of 1925 at 7 a.m., Elder Ballard dedicated the land. The missionary work was very slow and difficult in those early months. Of the 16 people attending the first church meeting, almost all were German immigrants. In the first 10 months while grandfather was there, the missionary saw only a small handful of, handful of converts join the church. Perhaps only one or two of them were native Latin people. However, before leaving South America on 4 July 1926, Elder Ballard prophesied, quote, The work of the Lord will grow slowly for a time here, just as an oak grows slowly from an acorn. It will not shoot up in a day as does the sunflower that grows quickly and then dies. But thousands will join the church here. It will be divided into more than one mission and will be one of the strongest in the church. The work here is the smallest that it will ever be. The day of will come when the Lamanites in this land will be given a chance. The South American mission will be a power in the church." Close quote. Brothers and sisters, many of you are aware of the remarkable growth of the church in South America. During the 40 years from 1890 to 1930, 31,449 missionaries were set apart to serve full-time missions. Worldwide church membership more than tripled from 183,000 to 663,000. Two stakes were developed into 104 stakes. By the end of the 1920s, missionaries were serving in 27 nations and three territories. Significant new missionary work was opened in Japan, Bolivia, Brazil, and the island country of Tonga. In addition to the new efforts in Argentina and South America I have just described. Beginning in 1830, national attitudes towards members of the church entered a new stage. Several factors brought it on. Radio began carrying throughout the country broadcasts of the remarkable Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The Church's care for our own teachings that led to a new vigor and welfare system during the depths of the Depression conveyed an impression of character and independence. For the first time, the balance of magazine articles about the Church became, in the mid-30s, 1930s, more positive than negative. President Heber J. Grant did much to lift the image of the church with the national business and political leaders. Attitudes improved steadily during the following years as the church patriotism and loyalty were demonstrated during World War II. As Mormons became prominent in government, business, sports, and other fields, and as growing, the growing missionary system and membership brought Mormons into neighborly contact with much of the population during the four decades from 1830 to 1970. 100, during that period, 106,799 full-time missionaries were set apart. Worldwide membership increased fourfold from 663,000 to 2,000,000 807,456. More than one million new members were added just in the decade of the 1960s. 104 stakes developed into 630 stakes. By 1970, missionaries were serving in 43 nations and nine territories. During this 40-year period, the South American nations of Uruguay, Paraguay, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela were open to missionary work. Church leaders reopened missionary work in Chile. 
In Central America, servants of the Lord unlocked the nations of Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In Asia, major new efforts began to bear fruit. <coughs> it, <coughs> excuse me. In Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and the Philippines. Of course, persecutions will always be with us, just as the prophet prophesied. In recent years, the church has been attacked openly by producers of the film, The Godmakers. A concerted effort by a band of enemies of the church is underway at this very hour. During recent media coverage of forged documents related to church history, Elder Dallin H. Oaks detailed instances of blatant misrepresentation and distortion. Remember how Colmany may defame and how coercive information was ignored by prominent newspapers such as New York, the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. Malicious charges leveled against the church's prominent leaders of the uh, prominent leaders of the church have not ended. The adversary has not ceased to work. Today we continue to face opposition and we can expect to continue it to continue as we endeavor to move this great work forward. Nevertheless, we are now seeing a great acceleration in the fulfillment of the prophet Joseph's prophecy that the truth will penetrate every continent, visit every clime, sweep every country, and sound in every ear. President Spencer W. Kimball led the church to new heights in carrying the gospel to the people of the world. The church called many more missionaries, and a greatly increased number of missionaries from their native lands were enlisted into the work. President Kimball called for a widened vision of the work and asked members of the church to lengthen their stride in moving the gospel across the face of the earth. He called upon the church to use all of the media, newspapers, magazines, television, radio, and their greatest power to convey the mess gospel message to the unreached millions throughout the earth. During the 15 years from 1970 to the end of 1985, when President Kimball died, 230,195 missionaries were set apart to soul serve as full time, their full time missions. More than double the number set apart in the preceding 40 years. Worldwide church membership grew from 2,807,456 to 5,000,000 in 1981. 3 million additional members. The number of stakes increased from 630 to 1,582. Missionary work was opened or reopened in many countries, including India, Sri, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Micronesia, Kiribati, and other island nations in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Conversion miracles were happening in many lands. I give an example from my own ministry. During the last week of January, 1988, the first president sent me to Lima, Peru, where we had 11 stakes of the church. Because of the rapid and healthy growth of the church in that city, I and the area presidency had the privilege of organizing seven additional stakes in one weekend to make a total of 18 stakes. I truly saw my grandfather's and the prophet Joseph Smith's prophecies fulfilled. A miracle had been accomplished there by the power of the Lord's Spirit working through his authorized servants, the missionaries. In the continent of South America, the one mission organized in 1925 has now been divided into 38. The 16 people present at the original church meeting now have multiplied many times over into a church membership in South America of more than 900,000 people organized into more than 200 stakes of Zion. The three missionaries who arrived in Buenos Aires in 1925 have swelled into an army of 5,650. Four temples are now in operation 
with more to be constructed in the future. We are now led by another great prophet leader, President Ezra Taft Benson. During the three years that he has presided over the church, fulfillment of prophecy is apparent to every spiritually attuned observer. During the short period, almost four years now, 90,000 missionaries have been set apart and sent into the world to proclaim the glad tidings of the restoration. Worldwide church membership has now increased to more than 7 million. We have 1,736 stakes of Zion. Our current force of missionaries under call as of today is over 40,000, serving in 226 missions in 88 nations and 22 territories. As brought by the power of the Spirit, more than 256,000 convert baptisms in 1988. Converts for 1989 will likely exceed 300,000. The Book of Mormon is being distributed and read as never before in our history. The day of 50 to 60,000 full-time missionaries is not far off. The work will continue to grow and prosper throughout the world. You probably have read about the near miraculous approval given to the Church by the government of the German Democratic Republic to allow foreign missionaries to teach in the Ger German Democratic Republic and to allow their youth to serve outside their country. In recent years, the Lord's servants have unlocked the doors and opened the work in Poland, Hungary, and Yugoslavia as well. They have opened many nations of Africa, including at Zambia, Nigeria, Ghana, Zaire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Swaziland, and the Ivory Coast. Twenty-two nations and territories have been opened in just the last five years. Many others have been opened and will be open to the preaching of the gospel. I feel the same as Orson Pratt when he said in 1859, quote, How could a young man, inexperienced as Joseph Smith was, have had this foreknowledge of future events unless he was inspired of God? How could he know if a church should arise that it would have any influence beyond his own neighborhood? How did he know it would be extended through the state of New York where it was first raised? How could he know that it would extend over the United States and much more that it would go to all the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles? To prophesy that a church would arise and have place in all the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles and then to prophesy that the mother of harlots would gather together vast multitudes among all nations and fight against the saints is taking a step far beyond what an imposter would undertake if he were disposed to successfully impose upon mankind. Close quote. I wonder what Brother Pratt would add if he saw the growth of the church in our day. This review of church growth from the prophet's time to ours is one more reason we know without question that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. When Elder Larson and I witnessed firsthand the profound growth of the Church in the face of the current violence and challenges in South America, my testimony was expanded greatly. And my testimony to you students here this morning is that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Savior's work will continue to roll forth in the world. Those of you who are preparing to serve the Lord as missionaries, I call upon you this morning to prepare well. Your day in church history is yet to be written. It will be what you make it. To those of you who have returned from your missionary service, remain true and faithful, for you will lead the church in the coming years with the challenges of continued growth. Oh, that I would have the power to open your eyes and cause you to see the vision of what yet lies ahead, and you 
Many of you sitting here as students at the Brigham Young University will carry a remarkable role in fulfilling the prophecies of the prophet Joseph Smith until that day does come when the great Jehovah shall say, it is enough. God bless you, my beloved young people, that your faith may be strong and powerful, that you will be up to that responsibility that will surely be yours. I testify to you that I know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He presides over this work. He is directing it through his prophets and his apostles here upon the earth. To this I testify, leaving my witness and blessing with you, that we will not shrink from our responsibility in writing the future history from 1989 until the great Jehovah comes once again, for which I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.